So if your Bible's not already open to the book of Ephesians, please turn there. And as you know, we're in the fourth chapter. Chapter four opens with the principle of unity, the call to walk worthy of our calling, and which is to, first of all, walk in unity with one another. Unity is the foundation for everything else that happens in the church, and God has provided this foundation. Two weeks ago, we began to look at this chapter and the command to walk worthy of our calling, and the calling has to do with God drawing us to himself. Uh, If you have repented and put your faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, it is not because you're so intelligent or perceptive, but rather because God drew you to himself. It's because God changed the disposition of your heart. And God opened that your heart to put faith, put your faith in Jesus. He opened your heart and granted faith and repentance and drew you into his family. And because of that, because of that, we are uh, part of the family of God, if that's what has happened to you. And I would like to say, right at the very outset of this message, that if that has not occurred in your life, if you're not sure that you belong to Jesus, that you have given, you have put your faith in him, you have repented of your sin, if you're not sure about that, talk with somebody today about that. Don't leave this building without being absolutely certain that you are in Christ, that Christ is in you. So we looked at that call. God calls us to himself. And then we looked at the attitudes that promote unity in verses 2 and and 3, that we, we talked about having all humility and gentleness with patience, bearing with one another in love, that we ought to bear with one another's weakness, Uh, That works within the church, within marriage, within friendships. In any relationship, we ought to bear with one another. And then we uh, started to look at that last uh, attitude, along with humility and patience. And at verse 3, we read, we ought to be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And so that is an attitude that promotes unity, being eager to maintain it. So when you think of, when you read the word eager, what do you think of? Uh, we, we think of something that is important to us, something that's a priority. When we're eager to do something, it's because it means something to us. We prize it. And so to be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit is to prize this unity. We don't have to create it. Notice the word is maintain. We don't have to be eager to create the unity of the Spirit. We have to be eager to to uh, promote that which God has already accomplished. And so every effort, spare no effort. The, uh, when it says to verse 3, be eager, it's in the present tense. In other words, there ought to be a continual process of promoting unity. It's not a once and done thing. It's something that we, we continually give effort to. It's not something that we, we do it once and say, well, that's, that's done, let's move on. But rather, it's an ongoing eagerness, an ongoing uh, promotion of this unity. We saw a lot in chapter 2 and 3 about what God has done to create this unity. So in our text, Paul is going to summarize it. But by way of review, think about what, what Paul has already said about what unites us. So go back to chapter 2 for a moment. Look at verse 19, <clears throat> where Paul says, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are, that is, so this, we, the, the people of God, we are fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household. So just, just there, there's two things right there that tell us that there's unity in, in a church, that we, uh, we're kingdom citizens and we have equal status, there, so there aren't any uh, second-class citizens, and no one's more important than the other in the kingdom of God. We're, we're fellow citizens. And then 
We are members of the household of God. So this refers to a family where, where um, God's household doesn't have any favorites. So it doesn't matter uh, your skin color or the language you speak or your nationality or your financial status or where you live or how much education you have or wh where you work or uh, whether you're pretty or not. You know, that doesn't matter to God. That doesn't have anything to do with your bearing uh, about your worth to God. God, when we come into the family of God, God makes us equal members of his household. That has a lot to do with unity. So there aren't any favorites in God's family. And then he says that we are a dwelling place. Look at chapter 2, verse 22. In him you also are being built together. So that has the idea that we're living stones, like Peter talked about. We're being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. And there's only, <clears throat> there's only one stone in this spiritual structure that, that is the most important. And guess what? It's not you. And it's not me. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the cornerstone of this holy temple. And so we belong to this temple... And there aren't any special stones but Jesus Christ. And so we are one. We are all built together and we have one purpose in, sense, in this sense. And it's been mentioned several times already today through the leading of the Holy Spirit. And that is, we're here, we come together as living stones to glorify God. That's our purpose. And then this unity is to be is something that God uses to speak to, and it's a mystery. Look at chapter 3, verse 10. It's a unity that speaks to the wisdom of God. We already looked at this, chapter 3, verse 10, that through the church, meaning the union of Jew and Gentile in Christ, the church, different nationality, different ethnicities, different people. This mystery is that the Gentiles, I'm sorry, I'm sorry chapter 3, verse 10, so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God, what wisdom? The wisdom to unite people who are very different. The manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This is important to God. We may not grasp fully all that that means, but it is unity is so important to God because his wisdom in drawing people together, people who are very different, under one Lord Jesus, we'll look at that, is so important because God wants to say something to the angelic beings, whether evil or the good, you know, we, we talked about that. Either way, God's wisdom is on display on how to unite people who are different. Under one head, the Lord Jesus. And so that speaks of unity. And we also looked at the unity that Jesus prayed for in John 17. Unity in a church is a powerful apologetic for the Christian faith. In fact, we don't really have a voice to, the, to, the, to this world if we are disarrayed, if, if we have discord. Because the world lives with discord every day. That's what they're used to. They see it. What what gets attention in the, uh, of the church is when people see the church as people who are different, and yet God has united them. That's a powerful apologetic. So, now to our text today. In our text, Paul uses seven terms to describe and summarize the foundation of our unity in Christ. Seven terms... And I'll read them to you. In verse 4, there is one body. Now, the word one is used seven times along with these different seven different terms. One body, one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. Verse 5, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. This is the foundation of our unity. This is a summary 
of our unity. A foundation is vital, wouldn't you say? You've all seen pictures. I don't know if any of you have been to the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Have you been there? I don't know. I haven't, but I've seen pictures. And why is it leaning? Well, it was built on uh, alluvial soil, sandy, shell, uh, shifting soil. And so as a result, it couldn't stand tall. The weight of it caused a, uh, it to tilt. And so, you know, it's the foundation. Uh, it, it is literally built on sinking sand. That's what, where it's built. But the foundation of our unity is not the sinking sand of our feelings and, you know, all the things that can change. The foundation of our unity is solid and stable stable and strong and durable and unsinkable and really eternal. And so I want you to see this God-designed unity, the foundation of our unity, that we are to prize and promote. Remember, we are, we are called to maintain the unity Keep it, promote it, protect it, guard it, maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So it is this unity that Paul talks about. Now, the word one, as I said, is used seven times, but the, the, the unity that we have is sevenfold. Did you notice that three of the seven have to do with the Godhead, with God? So we have one spirit, and we have one Lord. We'll see that that's a reference to the Lord Jesus. And one God and Father, who is over all and through all and in all. So here is the Trinity. Among, among these seven ones, there's a Trinity. And I think there's something for us to ponder there, that if God is Trinity, right, He's three persons in one God. He's showing us that we, who are more than one here, but we can be of one mind. We can be of one spirit. We can have unity. Just as the Godhead has unity. There's never been a time that the Father has disagreed with the Son, or the Son with the Spirit, or the Spirit with the Father. It's never happened. Yet three distinct persons one God. Can I explain Trinity? I don't think so. But yet the Bible is really clear that God is three in one. And so the, the unity of the Godhead becomes the model, the model for us as various people who are saved by grace, who, be, who are to be and continue to be one. So what is this unity? Unity. So he begins by saying that we are one, verse 4, there is one body. So each local church is an expression of the one body of Christ. To be in Christ is to be in his body, the church. So the emphasis is on the oneness within our diversity. One body, many parts. Like Paul said in 1 Corinthians 12, 12, for just as the body, that is a human body, is one and has many members, and all the members of the, of the one body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. I think that's why when you have the order here in verse 4, there was one body and one spirit, they're right, they're a, it's a couplet almost, because it is the Spirit who has made the one body. We are baptized into the body of Christ. <clears throat> Another emphasis within the concept of body is that we are an organism, not just an organization. Now, we need organization. We need a building. We need, these are important things. We need a place to meet, and we need organization, but our unity goes beyond being organized, as important as that is. We belong to one another. We need one another. We work together in loving relationships just as different parts of a human body work together to function 
properly. Relationships are what the body of Christ is all about. But this side of glory, we all know that no relationship is perfect. That's a truth that we just have to recognize, right? There's no perfect relationship. And we say and do things that strain our relationships. That happens in marriage. It happens with friendships. It happens in the church. It happens at the, in the workplace. It happens wherever two sinful human beings have to relate to one another. We, we strain at, with our words, our actions, and so on. And the old saying is, perhaps you've heard it, to live above with saints we love, oh, that will be glory. But to live below with saints we know, well, that's a different story, is it not? And dear friends, that's why Paul first tells us in verse 1, that we, in verse 2, that we walk in a manner worthy of our call with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit. <clears throat> we need that humility. We need the patience. We need, there's, there's not a soul here that hasn't created an issue in a relationship. And we need patience with each other and gentleness to bear with one another's weaknesses. Now, we may reduce the risk of conflict if we are not involved with each other, after all, if you're not in a relationship, if you're not involved, it's difficult to have conflict. But then the church is simply reduced to a building in which we gather, we watch something, and then we leave. Well, that's not church, as you know. The church is a body, and we belong to each other in a living way, and we live this out by participating in one another's lives. And so we, you know, um, sometimes church is messy. Relationships can get messy. But here's the thing. God has already provided the unity. We, we need to maintain it. We need to work at it. So, you know, we, we do things that will bring about reconciliation. That's part of maintaining the unity. You know, we go to a person. We talk with them. If we have... We've been offended. We don't talk about so-and-so with everybody else. We go back to the per Like, we don't, we don't do things that spread disunity. We, we do things that maintain the unity that God has already provided. The unity is something that is there, and in a sense, it's so strong that the oneness that we have from God is so strong. It's almost as if we have to suppress it to have discord in one sense. Because if we, we just walk with the Lord and we do the things that Matthew 18 says and other scriptures that talk about relationships, it, that unity will come flying back up like a, like a beach ball underwater. It, the, the unity is so strong. It, it's buoyant. It, the church can be buoyant with this unity, uh, with the unity that God has created. So we are one body. Let us remember that. An organism, not only an organization. We need each other. Yes, when we need each other, then we sometimes needle each other and get on each other's last nerve. But that's, again, why we need the humility and the patience. So we're one body. And then Paul says <clears throat> we're, uh, there is one spirit. You read this all over the New Testament. I read it already, 1 Corinthians 12, 13. There, for in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. The Holy Spirit works through each of us. There isn't a different spirit. It's one spirit. One spirit works in us. And he has, the one spirit has given us spiritual gifts to serve one another. There are, 1 Corinthians 12, 7, there are a variety of gifts, but the same spirit. There are all kinds of spiritual gifts in the body of Christ. And you can read uh, about them in Romans 12, Ephesians 4, 1 Peter 3, 1 Corinthians 12. And I don't even think that it's a, uh, a comprehensive list. 
I think it's a representative list. In other words, there may be other spiritual gifts that the Spirit of God gives, but they're all from, the point is, they're all from one Spirit. One Spirit gives these spiritual gifts, whether it's teaching or leading or giving or serving or discernment or uh, all, all kinds of gifts. They, there are varieties of gifts, but just one Spirit gives those gifts. And the same Spirit who places believers into the body of Christ is the same Spirit that empowers us to use these gifts to serve one another, even to serve the community. And so we may have different talents and abilities and gifts, a different shape, so to speak, and yet we, there's, it's all from the same Spirit. And if the work of the Spirit is to glorify Jesus Christ, and if that's our desire as we serve one another, then we all have this, we're, we're working, we're pushing the same rock the same way. And that's, that brings unity. Because we serve by the power of the Spirit for the purposes of God to glorify Jesus Christ. And th therein we find unity. So there's one Spirit. And then he says, there is just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. Now, hope can be viewed in one of two ways. It can be, and it's used in both ways in the New Testament. First of all, hope can be, and I want to use the word emotion, but I'm, I'm not happy with that, but I haven't come up with a better word. There's that sense in us of, of confident expectation. Hope. I have hope. I'm filled with hope, that sense of certainty about the future. I'm living with hope. The people without Christ live without hope all, all through their life, and yet believers have this, this hope within them. There's a, that confident expectation. That's one, one way of looking at hope. And then, and then there's the content. So there's confident expectation, that's kind of how we feel and, and, and the way we live our life. But then there's something that's underneath that, that that produces that expectation, and that's the content of our hope, the, the facts, the knowledge that produces hope. So when you read in chapter 1, verse 18, where Paul says, I pray that God will open the eyes of your heart, for he prays for three things there. And the first thing is, that you may know the hope to which you have been called. He, and so hope is attached to knowledge. So that knowledge of what's ahead, that is the content of our hope, produces the confident expectation. I, it's, it's part of our emotional structure, but it's more than that. But it comes out of content, knowledge, the things that that God says about our future. And the question is, what is in mind here when he says there is one hope? I have, uh, my hunch is that he's talking about the content of our hope, because if we have the content down, if we understand what's ahead for us as believers, it's going to produce the confident expectation. So, what is this hope? That, that what is the content that makes us confident? Well, you can read through the New Testament. You find a whole lot of references to hope. There is uh, the blessed hope, Titus chapter 2. The glorious appearing of our great God and Savior. That's our blessed hope. Uh, we, we have the living hope. We looked at that when we studied Peter. Uh, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We have a living hope because it's connected to the indestructible living life of Jesus. So our hope is tied to the life of Jesus. That's why it's called a living hope. John writes about hope and he calls it a purifying hope. 1 John 3, verses 1 to 3, uh, where he says, we know that when he appears, when Jesus comes back, we shall be like him because we shall be made like him. We shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope fixed on him 
purifies himself even as Jesus is pure. One day we'll be made just like Jesus in all his purity and glory in the sense of we don't be Jesus, but we'll be made like him in purity and without sin. And, and that's a purifying hope that, that one day I'm going to shed the, the sinful nature. All that goes along with that, that'll be gone. There will not be a struggle. And so John is saying, pure, live, a, live now in a pure way because that's what's ahead for you. That's your hope. It's a purifying hope. Hebrews talks about a stabilizing hope. A hope, is, uh, the writer of Hebrews says, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul that is connected to the throne of God. It's a very interesting word picture when you think about it. When I put an anchor, if, if I had a boat and I threw the anchor in, it would go down, right? It would sink down. But this anchor reaches up to the throne of God in heaven, to the right hand of God, to where Jesus is, who, who's in a body that still shows its wounds, and those wounds plead. They say, this salvation has been accomplished. And so my hope is, is heavenward, and when I yank on it, it doesn't move. It's stabilizing. This is a stabilizing hope. And Paul writes about hope as it is a patience-producing hope. Romans 8. What a wonderful book. Romans 8, what a wonderful chapter. And we wait patiently for God to consummate his redemption, which is the redemption of our bodies. Again, the, the release from sin and renewal, a new body. But with that is the renewal of all things, of all creation, which Paul speaks in chapter 1, verse 10 here in our text. and other places, the un uniting of all things, heaven and earth in Christ. There'll be a new heaven and a new earth and all the, all the things that we experience now that disappoint us, that cause tears and grief will be gone and all the wrongs that have been done will be righted. The, the, the suppression of truth that mankind has done will be judged, they'll be avenged. God will be seen as true Lord and everything that, that was wrong will be right and it will, everything will be as God intended that's what is ahead. And so Paul says, if we had it now, we wouldn't have to have hope. Who hopes for what they already have? But we wait patiently for it to come. This is a patience-producing hope that one day the dwelling of God will be with his people. And so I think it's safe to say that God is a God of hope. And to be without God in the world is to be without hope. What's the point? How does this unify? If all of this is ahead, why would we live in the, 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 the memory of the past? Somebody said this, somebody does that. And, and constantly be going backward uh, reminding ourselves of hurts or whatever. Why would we live in the past when God says, look at your future and focus on the hope that you have? And in heaven, one day we're going to stand shoulder to shoulder with everyone here who belongs to the Lord. So I, I would say that we ought to resolve things that keep us apart and live with the unity of the Spirit because the best is yet to come. If God won't keep a record of wrongs against us, why would we hang on to the past? We have hope ahead. That unifies us. So we have one hope. And then he says in verse 5, we have one Lord. One Lord. One Lord means one Lord Jesus. Okay. When, when you read Lord, Paul is saying Lord Jesus Christ. This is the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He is Lord. One day every knee will bow to this Lord and give glory to God the Father. So Jesus is Lord. There's one Lord, and that means that all authority is under him and, it de and derives its authority from him. It means that all human authority will render an accounting 
to the one Lord for how he or she has exercised that human authority. So for a believer in the first century and in the 21st century to say there is one Lord is to make a preemptive decision that we are going to obey the one Lord if we are called upon to make a choice between what this one Lord says or what a human authority says we ought to say or do or believe. It's a preemptive decision to obey the one Lord. And we gladly submit to human authority, except when it contradicts the Lord's commands. So if we were living in the first century, and we said, there's one Lord, folks, that would be heard in some ways as treasonous. Because in the first century, people were called upon to confess what? Caesar is Lord. And put a pinch of incense on the, on the fire or the coals. To say, no, there's one Lord and it's not Caesar. Now, I'll follow Caesar and I'll pay my taxes to Caesar, like Jesus said. But when Caesar says he is Lord, I'm sorry. I've already made a preemptive decision that he is an authority, but he's not the, the one true and ultimate Lord. And so Christians were actually called atheists in the first century because they would not confess or they, or let's say they would deny the existence of the Greek gods in, within the Roman pantheon. No, no, I don't believe in Marduk or whoever else, Nike, one of the Greek gods. I, no, no, th there's one God. There's one Lord. You're an atheist. Well, one Lord. But to say, as, as it says here in the text, there is one Lord and how this relates to unity is, is that it's not merely a confession of truth, but it was an allegiance. It was saying, I, I serve this Lord. I'm serious. I'm not giving lip service to this Lord. Like Jesus said, this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. No, no, when we say there's one Lord, it means we're serving that Lord. We're serious about him being the Lord of our life. We're serious about doing whatever he leads us to do because it's always the best. And we're bound together then in loyalty to this Lord. See, we don't have multiple lords. This was the problem in Corinth, you know, that where um, if you read chapter 3 in, of 1 Corinthians, Paul was saying, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really, I'm put out with you all. I'm paraphrasing. But he said, I'm really upset with you all because some of you are saying, I follow Paul. And somebody else saying, I follow Apollos. You know, wait, hold the phone. Back up the bus. This, this, there's one Lord. It's Jesus. We follow him. So it, what, when we say there's one Lord, that's what unites us. We serve a, a Lord Jesus Christ. One Lord. And that means our differences take a back seat to his lordship. We serve one Lord and he unites us and we're bound together in our loyalty to him. Can you begin to see the strength of this foundation? That this is not a foundation on shifting sands. The church doesn't have to tilt. The church, the foundation of unity has already been made. It's already been laid. It's that we simply need to maintain it. We need to promote it and, and, and prize it uh, and honor and, and pursue it. One faith. Now, um, I'm not going to be dogmatic, but I, I, I think I would say that Paul is emphasizing the content of our faith. He could be talking about there's a, one faith, meaning there's one way to get to heaven, faith in Jesus, not by works. Nobody's better than anybody else. You know, he could be, could be meaning that. Some people teach that, and that's fine. It's certainly true. I, I'm, I tend to think that what he means is there's just one true faith. There's one true faith, as it says in Jude, Beloved, I, uh, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. 
I think that's what Paul means, that there's only one true faith. It's found in the one book that God wrote. And this truth, the one truth, the, the Bible, the truths of the Bible, they unite us. Now, I know that there are different denominations and you know, people have different views on various things like church government or baptism and different things. And, you know, I would call those things secondary issues compared to the fundamental issues that, you know, we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, and that it's all for the glory of God alone. And our authority is the scripture alone, not tradition, not church tradition. I'm telling you what the Reformation was all about. That true faith unites us. There's only one true faith. The world says, you have your truth, I have my truth, we have our truth. The Bible says that Jesus is the, the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. There is one faith, and having joined together in this one faith, that unites us. It says there's one baptism, one faith, one baptism. Baptism is a sign and a symbol of, of the fact that you have entered into Christ's body, the church. Again, remember, we get into the church, the, the body of Christ, through the baptism of the Spirit. For by one Spirit, we were baptized into one body, whether Jew or Greek, slaves or free. We have all been made to drink of the one Spirit. A miraculous event, a miraculous work of the Spirit places us into the body of Christ. But you don't see that work. You don't see the, the Holy Spirit baptizing me. So Jesus commanded his disciples to make disciples by a number of things, teaching them to obey everything he commanded and baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So the baptism by water portrays visibly what the Spirit accomplished invisibly, and water baptism also pictures our cleansing from sin. It doesn't accomplish it any more than me going out and buying some ring and putting it on my fingers makes me marry. Uh, I needed to say I do and make some promises to, to that woman over there. And uh, then, then I got married. And the ring's just a symbol, see. Baptism is a symbol. It doesn't forgive sin. It doesn't, water baptism doesn't put me into the body of Christ. It pictures and symbolizes what God, what God accomplished. And so baptism is commanded by Jesus, Matthew 28. Make disciples, baptizing them. So I want to, you know, it's right in the text, baptism. So I ain't picking on you if you're not baptized, and you should be, all right? I, this is not what Pastor Ron is doing. <laughs> the, the scripture is bringing up the issue, and it's forcing you to ask yourself, well, am I a believer in Jesus? If I am, what's holding me back? What's holding me back from obeying the command to be baptized. And if you have, are a believer and you've yet to be baptized, I would be delighted to have a conversation with you. And I promise not to beat, beat up on your head, but rather to say, wonderful, and, um, and then we'll, we can talk about when. So one baptism, one baptism, a sign and symbol. There's not another one. The sign and symbol of our entrance into, entrance into, the body of Christ, the entrance into life. And that unites us. And then he says, there is one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Surely you can see how that unites us. We have one Father. We don't have different fathers. We have one Father, part of the same family, we are members of God's household. We serve one God, the king of the universe, who is over all. And he is at work 
in us and through us to accomplish his purposes. We're brothers and sisters in Christ, and we should have family affection for one another. And as I said, think about this. God, three persons, one God, Trinity. That is, that dynamic helps us understand how we can be different and yet be unified. So I hope you can see then that our unity is deep, it is stable, it is extensive, it's far-reaching, it's firm, and it's steadfast. We don't have to create it, we simply have to maintain it. That should tell us that it can be threatened. That should tell us that it requires some work. Be eager, do diligence. It should tell us that we could be doing things that would hinder or sabotage this unity that God has promoted, has provided. But we're simply called to maintain it, to prize it, to promote it, and pr to protect it. So how? We, well, we be together on Sundays and other times, pray together for God's help, for God's grace, God's guidance about anything. How wonderful to stop with another, another brother or sister and say, let's pray about that right now. That unified, serve together. Ask God, how can I use my gifts to serve you through the church and in the community. Love one another. The Bible says love covers a multitude of sins. And then patiently bear with one another one another's weaknesses. So there, the, there it is, the oneness that God has provided, the foundation of our unity. Now let us build on it, let us grow in it, let us glorify God through it. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for what you have provided for us. Oh, Lord, help us to prize this unity, to promote it. Help us to prioritize it. Give us grace, Lord, to be a unified church, ever growing in unity. As we read in the psalm, unity is such a beautiful picture. And it's where your blessing is. And so, Lord, bless us with unity and bless us as a church in all ways. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.